This morning, we are in Psalm 2, and uh, as we just started last week with Psalm 1. So if you'll open to Psalm 2, please, and stand with me, and let me read to you. If you do not have a Bible, and I sure encourage you uh, to get your own Bible. The Bibles we sell in the bookstore are priced, I believe, at the lowest price you'll find anywhere in town. And if you cannot afford a Bible, we will be more than happy to give you a Bible. But Psalm 2 is where we are this morning. Let me read it to you. And then um, we'll pray and get into this teaching here. Why do the nations rage or throng tumultuously? And the people plot a vain, worthless, or empty thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, or the Messiah, or Jesus, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Let's pray, please. Father, thank you so much for the blessings of this morning, even up until this very moment. We appreciate it. We thank you, Father, for your love that cannot be separated. Nothing can separate us from your love. Thank you, Lord, that you rejoice over us in your love. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross for the joy that was set before you, knowing that you would bring many sons unto salvation. And so we thank you, those of us who have come to you, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving our souls, giving us eternal life, making us joint heirs with you. We also thank you, Father, for our teacher, the Holy Spirit of God, who can give to us the spirit of wisdom and spiritual understanding as we look into the Word of God. And we pray for that this morning. We ask that he would testify of Christ and magnify Jesus. We ask, Lord, that he would reveal to all of us the will of God within our lives. We pray for any here today who have not yet been blessed to receive the gift of salvation, And ask, Lord, that you would pour your goodness into their lives, their mercy, open their eyes, and reveal the love of Christ to them, the salvation of God. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 actually set the tone for the rest of the book of Psalms. Psalm 1 opened with a beautiful statement, blessed. Psalm 1 ended 
with the reality of the judgment of the ungodly. Psalm 2 opens with a description of the ungodly and it ends with a promise for those who put their trust in God. The difference between these two Psalms and the rest of the book of Psalms has been called, Psalm 1 has been called the law, Psalm 2 has been called the prophets, the law and the prophets, a statement used uh, frequently in the Bible to speak of the entirety of the Bible. But starting in Psalm 3, we are going to see uh, the beginning of expressions on a human level covering almost every human emotion possible, every kind of condition a godly person can find themselves in and the wicked. It is overflowing with comfort. It's overflowing with the realities of fear, the challenges of life, and the wonderful comfort of God. But here in Psalm 2, it's divided into four particular sections where, first of all, we have a description of society in its rebellion against God. We then have God speaking very directly about them. And we then, thirdly, have Jesus Christ telling us what his Father told him and finally we have the Holy Spirit extending an invitation to the people who are mentioned in this psalm which is mankind in general but the first part asks some questions about humanity in general verse 1 says why do the heathens Rage. Why are the heathens raging? And the word rage there means to throng tumultuously, like the, the raging of an ocean. What a good question. Why do the nations rage? And when you think of nations today, large nations, smaller nations, etc., why are they in such an upheaval? And secondly, the people plot a vain thing. Why do people plot a vain thing? And the word plot there is a word which speaks of, uh, it speaks of worthless emptiness, and it communicates the activities of people who are complaining and discontent. So right off the bat, He's saying, why, is, why are nations like the, the waves of the sea never settled? And why are people complaining? Why are people uh, not content? Why are they trying to come up with plots that are actually worthless and they're actually empty? And then he goes on to actually, uh, in verse 2, describe now the activities of kings and of rulers explaining what they do. Notice in verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against God, against Jehovah, and against his anointed or Jesus Christ. Here's what they say. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So why are the nations raging? Why are they like they are? Why are people complaining all the time and they're miserable and they're coming up with things that actually are empty? They do them no good. And then to look at the reality of how kings and rulers actually reject the Lord, they take counsel against him, and they specifically are against the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a description of mankind from Genesis all the way through history, currently 
leading into the tribulation period. Quick example from Genesis in terms of rebellion against God, taking counsel against God, being against Christ, setting themselves against God. When Satan, the first rebel that we know of, rebelled, one-third of the innumerable company of angels joined him in his rebellion against God, which was motivated by jealousy and lack of contentment. He was not happy to be in the position that God had him. He wanted to be like God. And so he revolted, and he spread his jealousy among these other angels who have a free will, and one-third of them decided, yeah, I'm with you, and we're going to follow you. We, we want to be in positions of authority as well. Not unlike some of the apostles, the sons of Zebedee, uh, his mother came, she came to Jesus and she said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, she said, would you grant me that when you come into your kingdom that my two sons, one can sit on your right and one can sit on your left. In 1 John chapter 2, it speaks of the lust of the flesh, the, 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 the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, of wanting to exalt yourself against the things of God. And so, right there in Genesis, Satan came into the picture with Adam and Eve, and he seduced Eve. The Bible tells us in one of the pastoral epistles that Adam knew exactly what was going on. He failed to protect his wife as a husband should do. He just let this whole thing happen, and sin entered the world, we're told in Romans 5, through uh, Adam. But right away as the devil began to, to speak ill of God and to say God didn't mean what he said, Eve rebelled against God, who had told the both of them, listen, you can have whatever you want here except that one thing, don't eat of that tree. Beautiful paradise, just don't eat of that tree. And in the day, if, if you do, in the day that you eat of it, we're going to be separated. And ultimately, you will physically die. And the devil said, that's not going to happen. And so she ate of that tree, and immediately you find them uh, hiding from God, whereas they had been walking in the cool of the day with the Lord and enjoying his presence and how happy they must have been and how happy God was with his creation, everything he created. And he says, and it was good, and it was so good. He had created Adam, and he said, it's not, it's not good that he's alone. He created Eve, and, and well, then the Lord later said, well, I don't know if all that worked out exactly. No. <laughs> Delete. Gone, gone, gone. Little side joke, but it's reality because of sin. And then what did one of their first two children do? Cain would not come to God on God's terms. He rebelled against what God had laid out, which is grace and faith. And he came to God based on his own works. And even after being corrected, he refused to accept the correction. He wound up murdering his brother. That rest of that chapter talks about a guy named Lamech who raised himself up and became a mean ruler. And then the Tower of Babel and exalting themselves. And, and then you see all of the different stories, the different narratives and Pharaoh and Egypt and all of the, the cruelty, the deliverance of the people going into the promised land and their obedience and the blessing of God, their disobedience and the, the curse of God that he said would happen, you'll be in trouble and they would then call out and be delivered. And then the, the, all of the major prophets, the minor prophets coming down to the people, always pleading with them, don't walk in opposition to God, but come to him. He loves you. He wants to bless you. He will bless you. And how they rejected the prophets and told them, shut up, and they killed some of them. And then God said through one of the parables, surely they'll, they'll take my own son when I, I'll send my own son to them. And of course, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They crucified him. They said, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And they rejected Christ. 
And then in all through the epistles in the early church, you see uh, those coming into the church, perverting the word of God, rebelling against God. And then as you get into the book of Revelation, you see now the judgment, the final judgment of God coming upon mankind such as never has been nor never will be, and then the beautiful 1,000-year reign of Christ with peace on the earth. A.B. Simpson, a great commentator now in heaven, has described this rebellion better than I can, and I'd like to just ask your close attention to, to hear what he has said about this rebellion against God, rebellion against Christ. He says, this is the spirit of lawlessness which in every age has resisted the authority of God and is culminating today as never before in a thousand forms of license and lawlessness and which is to reach its full development in the coming of the Antichrist. We see it in its most extreme forms in the anarchy and socialism of our age and the revolt of men against every form of government and religion. We see it next in the democratic tendencies of our time. We see it in the bold antagonism of many to the authority of the Christian religion and the popular demand for a freedom that ignores the Lord's day. I don't know if you saw Bernie Sanders the other day questioning and just berating a man about his faith who has a constitutional right to have a, a, the right, the freedom to religion. And Mr. Sanders was violating his office as a senator, belittling this man, trying to mock him about his Christian belief. He was trying to embarrass him, and, and I, hopefully he's going to be sanctioned by the rest of Congress. But right on television here, just the other day, and read, I read something quickly on the TV last night or this morning, some, the craziest thing, some, some student somewhere now got in big trouble because he, he had a Bible in his backpack. I mean, these things are really, really, really happening. They were not really, really happening even 10 years ago to the degree that they are now. 15, 20, 30 years ago, you would have never heard of this. And so trends portend to what is coming. Why do people speak against God? Why are they rejecting God? Why do they mock God? And in place of it all, bringing in uh, so many things, ignoring the Lord's day. There used to be the blue laws where you couldn't even buy liquor on a Sunday. There used to be that businesses closed on Sunday. It used to be that schools and athletic programs didn't have things on Sunday and Wednesday out of respect for the Christian religion in our nation. That's all gone now. That's all gone. The laws of marriage and even the restraints of morality, gone out of the window. We see it in the insubordination of the young, the precocious freedom of the children of our land, the dissolution of parental authority and control, and the irreverence and self-will of the young. And this Ryan Reese who's coming here, uh, the son of one of today's great pastors who lived in such rebellion against God, he was... he. He, he could do anything he wanted. He had as much money as he wanted. He had all the connections he wanted. He traveled all around the world looking for what he never found until one day in South America he opened the Bible and started reading it and had a dramatic, dramatic conversion. And he knows about these young people. He has a heart to reach them. You know, we've been led to our surprise to reach out into the great schools to these young children, a wonderful ministry. This is going up now into the junior high and the senior high, 
and a very, very effective ministry. The self-will of the young. I was speaking with a police officer just the other night who told me as a police officer at Redwood High School how uh, 40 gang members just surrounded him one day because he, the day before he had to arrest one of their gang members. Uh, and he went into great detail about what was going on. I mean, uh, think of when I was a kid, if you got called to go to the principal's office, you needed to wear diapers on your way down there because you were scared to death. And what they did back then, they had a paddle, they bent you over and had you looking down a hallway and they whacked you and sent you into orbit all the way down that hallway. And it's not like that today in the schools. Ganging up on a police officer, threatening him. We see it in the spirit of freedom that is entering the church of Christ and lowering the standard of Christianity, the spirit of compromise with the world and the laxity of Christian life, the rejection of the authority of the scriptures, the tendency to reduce even God's word to the standard of human reason, the refusal of the human heart to submit to God's requirements of personal holiness on the part of his people, the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of professing Christians, and the refusal to believe that God requires personal holiness on the part of all who claim to be, be his people and his followers. Without holiness set apart to God, no man will see the Lord. We see two classes even in the church. Those who accept God's holy will in all of its requirements and those who do that which is right in their own eyes. The, the age is rapidly drifting into license and lawlessness and we need not wonder at the bolder forms that the daring infidelity and wickedness assume in defying the very authority of heaven and claiming that man is able to be God unto himself, we shall see yet greater things than these. The world is hastening to its Armageddon, quote, for the battle on the great day of God Almighty, end quote, Revelation 16, 14. So why do the nations rage? Why do the people imagine a vain thing? And the rulers are taking counsel together and against God and against his anointed. And the, the thing about verse 3 is this is what they're saying, but they're completely, completely misguided in what they are saying. Let us break their bonds in pieces, the Father and the Son, and cast away their cords from us. They feel as if uh, the, that God is going to restrain them, their bonds, their cords. And of course, before you were a Christian, perhaps and no doubt many of you thought, oh yeah, you know, to be a Christian, you have to give up everything. Well, that's not true at all. What, you, what, what happens is you receive everything. You receive the gift of God. Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. You are either a slave of unrighteousness or a slave of righteousness. And so ungodly, unsaved men are blinded by the devil. Their understanding is darkened and they believe that God has got them locked up in chains and they don't want to have anything to do with God's, what they call God's chains. So it's, a, it's an inaccurate statement to say the least. How sad. How sad to think that the creator who sacrificed his own son is going to lock you up. No, he's going to set you free. He's going to set you free. Now, in verse 4, it speaks to us about God, and it tells us what God is going to do. In verse 4, it says, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. couple of things. First of all, 
God is actually sitting in heaven upon his throne of grace. And there is a heaven, and that's where he is. And with respect to all of these people thinking, we're, gonna, we're going to fight against God, we're going to fight against Christ, we're not going to let them bind us up. It says, he who sits in, hev in the heavens shall laugh. Now, I have to be honest with you. When I've read that over and over, I've thought, gosh, that's not very nice of him. But it's not a mocking kind of a laugh. It's kind of like saying, really? <laughs> You're going to destroy me? Really? Huh. It's, it, it has that kind of a thing. I mean, is there anybody here, of course, anybody here who says, I can whip him? No, anybody? Well, what about if all of us together, well, look, let's make a big army. Can we whip him together? Of course not. So God is looking at the rebellion of man, and he's saying, it's, it's, it's you know, he, he laughs. That's all you can say. God never does anything wrong. He's not demeaning them. It doesn't mean he doesn't love them, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's how foolish to think that you can rebel against God and get away with it and find yourself in wherever you think you want to be when it's all said and done. Then it says in the last part of verse 4, the Lord shall hold them in derision or in contempt or accountability. You know, if you were in a court of law and you didn't obey the order of the judge, you're held in contempt. You violated the law. You're responsible to then pay whatever penalty is, you know, assigned to you. God is holding people accountable for their rebellion. And, and listen, he isn't doing it with joy or happiness. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. No pleasure at all. His desire is that every man would turn to him and come to repentance and be saved. But if they won't, he holds them accountable. Going on in verse 5, it tells us what, what the Lord is going to do, what he's going to speak, and how he's going to speak, and what is going to happen. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath. Now, so this is now taking us into the book of Revelation a Christ-rejecting world. We believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. We believe God is going to remove his church before the tribulation of God is brought to the earth. God is going to speak to a Christ-rejecting world in his wrath. That's how he's going to deal with them. He's going to, it's the wrath of the Lamb of God. And the, then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. It is, it's not pleasing to him. Man is going to be so distressed. Half or more of earth's population will perish during the tribulation. Famines. Lack of water plagues, what distress man is going to be in. And if you don't believe it, if you don't think it's going to happen, you have to ask yourself this question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ, if he is God, then you would have to acknowledge that he cannot lie? then if you study the words of Jesus Christ, you will know he is the singular most vocal person in the entire Bible about hell. 
He speaks about these matters. So you can't pick and choose what you like out of the Bible. God is going to speak to a Christ-rejecting world in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. And then in verse 6, he continues to speak, and he says, yet, and this is going on with prophecy, yet or in spite of all the rebellion, and then in spite of the tribulation, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. He's speaking prophetically about the fact that when Christ returns to the earth, he is first of all God's king. God is setting him as king ruling from Jerusalem in the new temple for 1,000 years. So regardless of what man does, God's going to do what he's going to do. And you and I will be there. Oh, what a happy day. Andre Crouch used to sing, Oh, happy day. More, it's, it's happier than we can even imagine. In fact, I'm going to sing it for you right now. No, no, that'll, that'll, if there was anything happening, that'll certainly pull the plug on it right there. But oh, happy day. We will reign as kings and priests with him. Jesus, he said, I, I've set my king on my holy hill. You rulers, you kings, you judges, you can, you can rebel, reject all you want. Jesus is going to rule. Nobody's going to take him out. Where's Napoleon? Where's Saddam Hussein? Where's Alexander the Great? Where's uh, all of the great leaders of the world? What's happened to them? Where are they today? Jesus is alive today, risen from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of God, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, and he's going to come back. Now in verse 7, you have Christ speaking. I will declare the decree. He says, I'm going to tell you what God has said, what God has decreed. And by the way, uh, when God decrees something, it's, it's not subject to change, modification, revisionism. It can't be negated. It can't be uh, undermined. It can't be removed. It's a, what, have I not spoken and shall I not do? So Jesus says, I'll tell you what, what he said. I will declare the decree. Here's what, here's what the Father said to the Son. He said, ask of me, Jesus, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Ask me. Son, I'm sending you as a lamb to die for the sins of the world, but I'm going to send you back as the king of the world. And of course, it's, this is inside information. And it's, and it's the plan of God really being put in question for me. Hey, what would you like? Ask of me. I'll give you the whole world. Do you remember what Satan said to Jesus when he tempted him? He said, listen, if you'll just bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. He knew what was coming. He said, you don't need to go to the cross. I'll, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. He could have given them to Jesus within the restricted power that he had, but eventually it would, it would crumble. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. By the way, and the ends of the earth for your possession, I'll give you the whole world Romans chapter 8 says, you and I have been made joint heirs with Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 says, Christ is the heir of all things. So if he is the heir of all things and we're joint heirs with him, it does not mean that God's going to because the pie would, how could you slice a pie up to give everybody an equal part? I mean, it just seems like it does, but that's not what it means. It just means that everything he has, we have also. We have, <laughs> talk about being happy. 
about what's coming, our hope. I mean, this is what's going to happen to us. Our Lord is going to, he's being set king there in Zion, Jerusalem, Israel. Ask of me, I'll give you the whole world, the ends of the earth for your possession. And we are joint heirs with him. This is our hope. Rege Paul said in Romans 5, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know, somebody somewhere must have heard it from the devil. They said, oh, that person's so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Now, I would admit that there are people who, maybe there's something wrong with their minds to begin with. I mean, I wouldn't know about that. But in reality, the more heavenly-minded you are, the more you study about where you are going, that is your eternal home, the more you learn about what God has in store for you, it has a powerful effect upon your living here upon the earth. 1 John chapter 3, He that hath this hope in him, cleanses himself even as he is clean. Didn't quote that quite right. Purifies us. Oh, the police now, they have these sneaky cars. Nothing on them. The lights pop up on the dash. I mean, if you, if you, you know, some people drive 80 looking in the rear view mirror. And you can spot the, the Ford Explorers, you, you know, if you really watch it, you can see them and look, and if you watch it. Now, again, this is research on my part. <laughs> Just like Joel here, I'm doing a thesis on it. One of them got me recently. I was just in a hurry. And the, the reason he got me wasn't because I was in a hurry. I was actually going the same hurried speed that everybody else was, but they were going too slow for my thought. So I went from the far left lane across six lanes in a blue car, which there aren't many of those around. That's what caught his attention. I got back in the far left lane. I thought, okay, all these slow pokes are behind me. And I looked up there and I thought, oh, there he is. <laughs> Lights going. We pulled over. And I was so polite. I mean, I was and very genuine. I, I safely pulled over, went way off the shoulder, r rolled the window down, took my driver's license out. And uh, I said, yes. You're wrong. No, I didn't say that. I said, yes, I was speeding. And he, he was just smiling the whole time. I thought, that's interesting. He's just smiling away at me. And so he kind of asked me who I was, and he saw different things in my car, and I told him, and he said, okay. He came back, and he gave me my license. He said, he said now, as you speed off, and I thought, what? As I speed off? He meant get speeding so you can get on the highway at the right speed. I, I did not get a ticket, and I know where he hides now. <laughs> and, and I travel back and forth there, and I'm, I bet you he sees me a lot and says, oh, there's that guy. <laughs> I tell you all of that to say if you're wondering if I've just lost myself in an illustration, which has happened on occasion. If we know where we are going and we're living in that living hope, it's part of our life. It affects the way we live down here. If you have a police officer driving behind you, do you just speed or do you, are you Mr. Good Citizen? Pretty simple, right? There's accountability 
the knowledge of the Lord, of his coming, of what's going to happen. So be as heavenly minded as you can be. You will be the most earthly good. And on the reverse side, people who do not know much or little about where they're going. They don't understand where they're going. They think heaven is boring. They think we're just going to play harps and sit around. And, you know, that doesn't sound very much fun. And I would agree. That, has, that is not even nothing. That's not part of where we're going. That's not anything to do with heaven. And so, you and I... And, and so to finish that thought, the, the less heavenly minded you are, the less earthly good you are. In verse 9, he says, now this is what the Lord had, this is what the Father had said to the Son, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The rod, rod of iron is the scepter that represents kingship, iron being a symbolic, symbolic of strength. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You're going to rule and reign upon the earth. And then notice, you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. In that culture, when an army was going to go out to battle against a nation, they would formulate these clay pots and inscript on them, write on them the names of their enemies. And as they got ready to uh, as they were staging and getting ready to deploy, they would have a big ceremony and they would come and they'd smash those pots as a way to inspire the troops. This is what we're going to do to them. And God is saying, this is what I'm going to do in my wrath to the people who have rejected God and rejected Christ. So he's talking about the judgment of God. In verse 10, it's the Holy Spirit speaking. And if you are here this morning and you, you know that you are not a Christian, you've been wondering about becoming a Christian, you're feeling guilty within yourself about the way you've been living, but you also have the sense that God is trying to speak to you, may I ask that you listen very, very carefully to these next couple of verses. Because this is the key to you winding up in heaven instead of in the lake of fire. Notice in verse 10, Now therefore, in light of all that's just been said, be wise, O kings. And so a man can change. He can go from being against God to having the wisdom of God. Be wise. Maybe you're the king of your business. Maybe you're the king of your home. Maybe you're the king of your own mind. Be wise. And then be instructed. Allow yourself to be instructed. Don't close your mind off to what God has to say, you judges of the earth. Be instructed. And then serve the Lord with fear, with respect, and rejoice with trembling. What a joy. Rejoice with trembling. And then notice this interesting phrase, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. That little word kiss, uh, is, it, it speaks of three things. It speaks, first of all, of submission. The kiss is the oriental token of absolute submission. And so our first attitude toward Christ must be surrender. Do you remember when you surrendered to Christ? He's saying, surrender to Christ. Look, when you raise the white flag of surrender in battle, it means you're going to become a prisoner of war, and who knows what they're going to do to you. When you raise the white flag of surrender to Christ, you're going to become free. 
It starts with you surrendering to him. It speaks of your submission. He will lead you into a life of union with him, but we first have to submit to his to him unconditional surrender. And then what you find is he's going to welcome you. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Let me lead you. Come underneath my leadership and learn of me and, and I'll, you'll find rest for your souls. He will welcome you with tender love if you'll come to him. That kiss also expresses reconciliation which tells of friends divided meeting in love and forgiveness. It's like Jacob and Esau being reconciled together, embracing one another. It's like the story of the prodigal son and the father running to meet him and they, they fell into each other's arms with the kiss of reconciliation. And it's speaking of the father waiting to forgive you and receive you. And that kiss also means more than submission and reconciliation, but it speaks of intimate friendship and tender love. Jesus will bring you into his inner circle. He is not a respecter of friends. He will welcome you as his friend. So kiss the son. Come to him. Notice, lest he be angry. In other words, it's now or never. You either get saved now or you will experience the wrath of God. It is appointed unto man once to die and then comes the judgment. There's no, oh, wait, yeah, oh, I, I'm, I see it now. I'm sorry, can I? No. Kiss the son, come to Christ lest his anger against sin comes upon you and you perish in the way. First part of Jesus' first sermon, he said, he said, repent or you will perish. You know, we need the word of God today. Mike and I, Pastor Mike and I, were recently at a, a funeral. It was so sad. The Bible was never opened. Nothing even close to the gospel was presented. It troubled us during the service. It troubled us the rest of the day, I later spoke to some other folks who had been at that same service. It troubled them. It was troubling. I, we hear it all the time. The Bible is gone. The truth is gone. Winds of doctrine blow like hurricanes and the devil knows that his time is short and he's working overtime. Lest you perish in the way, notice, when his wrath is kindled but a little, just a, a, t a, 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 a t you know, those little plungers that you can't think of the name of it. You, know, you pull it out of a little bottle, but a, a little teaspoon of God's wrath. How, how, how horrible would that be? Just a little bit of his wrath against somebody. Just a little bit. And then the beautiful ending here now. Blessed or oh how happy are all those who put their trust in him. And it's the happinesses, plural. It's literally the way it reads. It, and it's an exclamation of great emotion. Oh how happy 
are people who've trusted God. You know, when Joel was standing here talking about Vietnam, I asked him, first service, are you going to go by Da Nang? And he said, oh, yeah, I'll go right. And I said, well, look for Marble Mountain and Monkey Mountain. I was 12 miles south of Da Nang. And I was thinking back, uh, we used to call it when you were there and you watched the 747s fly over. We'd say, oh, yeah, they're going back to the world, we'd call it. And I, I was thinking in my own life, way back then, would, uh, praying for somebody in a church going back to Vietnam of all places and of all that's transpired in my life and of how thankful I am for my life and as imperfect as I am and just with you in this walk. Oh, how happy. The happinesses. And if you don't think God is happy, let me back up, because this kind of rocks people's boats when you say, do you know that God is happy? This was, really? I thought he was kind of mad. He's kind of angry. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. God is perfect in all of his ways. Do you think he is unhappy? Do you think Adam and Eve were walking around saying, man, that unhappy guy, he created us? And... Oh, it's terrible. No. And can you imagine... All, all, when you start reading your Bible, look for all the times where it says rejoice, blessed, happy. It'll, you know how it, when you buy a Honda for the first time in your life, you see Hondas everywhere, right? You start looking for the word rejoice or bless. It's everywhere in the Bible, but it's in our culture for various reasons. The happiness of God has not been something. Have you ever heard a sermon on the happiness of God? Anybody? I doubt it. You're here, you could raise your hand now, you're hearing a little mini one. <laughs> could you imagine how, ha how happy are you going to be to go to heaven? You're going to be happy? So can you imagine we all show up in heaven grinning from ear to ear and we look up and there's God going, you're going to be with me forever. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, does it? Jesus went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life more abundantly and that your, my joy might be fulfilled in you. He said, my joy. And in his priestly prayer in John 17, he talked about rejoicing in the joy that I had with you before I came here. Oh, how happy is the person are all those who put their trust in him. You say, well, I'm not real happy. Well, doesn't mean there aren't tears and fears and trials, but it says here, those who put their trust in him. The counsel I get when I'm going through the fire, trust God. Believe God. That, that takes care of it, doesn't it? They that come to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, I'm going to end there, and man, you guys have kept me way over time. I, I was trying to get out of here... I really didn't know about the time. <laughs> I am so sorry. Um, but I sure enjoyed it, and I hope you did too.